A warm welcome to all of our viewers and listeners to the first episode of True Peace in a Pod, a space where Eastern wisdom meets Western living. Your hosts for today will be me, Gail, also known as 50 Sister across my online channels. And I'm coming to you today from sunny southern Portugal. With me, I have Venerable Nick and Venerable Michael, and they're joining you from tropical Thailand. <laughs> this is a space that we've created for you to find peace and a place for learning. Our aim is to bring like-minded people together to create a community. So sit back, get comfortable, and relax. <laughs> Our first episode introduces meditation and includes a 10-minute guided meditation. Venerable Michael will now share with you an overview of what our podcast aims to achieve. Over to you, Venerable Michael. Thank you so much, Gail, for that beautiful introduction and welcome everyone to True Peace in a Pod. I always smile whenever I say that name because it was a group effort to come up with it. And uh, in addition to being a clever little play on words, I think it really captures what we're hoping that you gain from this podcast, uh, which is true peace that you can integrate into your life. And so the format that it's going to be delivered is typically we're going to start off with a little meditation tip so you understand the fundamentals of this transformative practice. Each month, we're going to give you a new tip to build that foundation for you. And then we'll do a guided meditation about 10 minutes to uh, feel the benefits of the practice in real time. And then we'll transition into a topic that we have planned for that month. And then after we have a discussion about how you can integrate that specific topic, the how to balance your life or how to integrate healthy habits in that specific realm, then we'll go into a little bit of a practical tips about how you can actually integrate those things into your life with a little bit of homework at the end. Uh, so for today, it's going to be a little bit different uh, because we're going to take some time to introduce ourselves. So you'll have our backstories and know who we are and where we're from. And then uh, we also, this topic, as Gail had said, will be about meditation specifically. So we'll be addressing some questions that the viewers have submitted. So we're very excited. Uh, but with that, Venerable Nick, you want to share some openings? Yeah, statements? awesome. Thank you so much. I'm a bit nervous, but also very excited uh, just because to have a new format like this, uh, to have a discussion about healing, about transformation, how to have happiness and peace into your life. It's so exciting. And also I'm excited to form a new community. People with like-minded individuals wanting to change themselves. It's gonna be a fun journey. And the last thing I'm excited about is your transformation. And I know this podcast uh, is about us or highlights us in our story, but it's not about us. It's not about our accomplishments, what we're doing. But for me, it's, it's about you all who are watching. And I want to be able to see your change, your progress, your transformation from day one as we go month to month. So just ready to go on this journey with all of you. So very excited. Thank you. Well, I suppose we ought to introduce ourselves now because we've been speaking to each other for a little while and some people on my channel will know about yeah, both of you and some of the people on your channel might know about me, I don't know. But it would be a good time now for us to make our personal introductions. So I wanted to tell you about how I, I came about being online. I started my channel called 50 Sister and it was to inspire women to make positive change, to be able to transform and thrive. But... Uh, in 2021, I found myself in a dark place and my mind was in total chaos. I just couldn't stop the noise in my head. And I was looking for a way to quieten my mind and take control of my mental health. It was really that bad. I was really in a dark place. 
So I searched online, trying to find some inspiration to try and get myself out of the darkness, just a little chink in the darkness. And that's where I found Venerable Nick's YouTube channel. Your YouTube channel, Nick, completely changed my life. And it was a really, really uh, difficult time for me. And you helped me create a peaceful space in my mind and create all day in the chaos because my mind was totally in chaos. So your videos, I watched one, I watched two, I watched all of them. I was a little uh -huh. bit addicted uh, with a beautiful setting and your kind words and your calm ways. Uh, you totally transformed the way that I think about everything. So I went through my own transformation, it was a total metamorphosis. And from that darkness came the light and from the light came a book. And I wrote a book, The Midlife Edit, which was actually to help other women who might find themselves a little bit lost in midlife as well, as lots of women over age 40 can there's so much change there's so much turmoil and it's a time that you need you need help and i found help through you you actually helped me and i know together we want to help more women so i had been sharing your channel with my audience and i had lots of people oh what's the channel what's the channel and i was sharing my your channel with my audience and then i remember writing to you and just saying thank you so much for making your videos they really inspired me they really changed my life and i didn't expect a response because i know you're really really busy but you responded and um i was just really grateful for that response but then this year earlier this year you reached out to me and you said how can i help you help more women and that was amazing. And that was, that was just incredible. And the three of us, between the three of us, Venerable Michael, Venerable Nick and myself, we talked about hosting retreats uh, all over the world. But of course, that's, that costs money. And I know that we're all quite keen to keep uh, the wisdom free and to share it with as many people as possible. So that's how the podcast came about, is a way for us to shine our light. So that's a little bit about me. And that's a little bit about how we became connected so i'll hand over to you now nick so you can introduce yourself too okay uh for myself i'll just share a backstory thank you for that beautiful story by the way Gail. <laughs> i love hearing that and so excited to be part of your journey uh, for myself is i grew up in laos a small country next to thailand i'm the youngest of four boys uh, at that time it was a war going on because of communism uh, our family got on a boat, tried to flee the country. As we're trying to leave that country for us, we got caught by the military, got held at gunpoint and was taken to a refugee camp. So my childhood consisted of living in a refugee camp in Thailand, uh, being um, taken to a refugee camp in the Philippines, and then eventually coming to America when I was five years old. So can you imagine as a little boy crying every single day, taken to kindergarten? I'm like, I just want my mommy. I don't know what's happening. And that transition was so traumatic. And it mm -hmm. took a year of just crying every single day. And, but eventually for me, I was able to adapt. And one of the things coming to the United States as an immigrant, as a refugee that you develop is resilience. And for me, I took that head on. Our family always taught us to be successful, get an education, get a good career. And that's what I did. So I graduated from San Diego State University with a degree in communications. Uh, after that, I went to work as a real estate agent selling houses in San Diego and then eventually made a transition of being uh, uh, going back to school for counseling, uh, working as a licensed marriage and family therapist at a group home and then eventually transferring to owning my own private practice in Malibu, California, and also working at a drug treatment center in Malibu, California. And besides that, I was also a professional dancer. So hip hop, modern, ballet, <laughs> just doing everything and pursuing the American dream. And at the top of my career, at the peak and the heights of it, if I were to be honest, for me is I always had this underlying sadness, this underlying emptiness. And I remember one day I was with my coworkers just sitting at lunch and they told a joke and everyone laughed, including myself. But in that moment, I noticed that, wow, when other people laugh, they have joy in their eyes. Yeah. And if I were to be honest, I, I 
I didn't have joy. And that's when I said, wow, how old are you? And you don't know what brings you joy? That's a bit sad. And for me, I just knew in that moment, I had to go answer this question for myself. No one can answer this question for me. And I, it started my spiritual path. And with that, I said, let me go find the answers. So I got on the plane <laughs> and became a Buddhist monk. And I haven't looked back ever since. And I'm happy to say that many years later, for me is when I do laugh, I do feel joy. So <laughs> it was a long process, but I'm excited to be able to share whatever we've learned on this path. And I'm so excited to be here with Gail, just because I started getting tagged on Instagram from this random woman <laughs> in Portugal. <laughs> and I was following your journey for a year or two. And I saw uh, what you were doing and it was so inspirational. And I saw the community that you were building and you were changing so many people's lives, uh, women uh, above the age above 50, 60 and up and giving people so much hope and joy. And I said, I got to reach out one to say congratulations to you. You're doing fantastic and you're a practitioner. And secondly, um, I wanted to be able to just support you. You're making such a big difference all around the world to so many people. And I said, how do we help you and how do we support? And fast forward, we're here now with a podcast for all of you to witness together. So thank you. Oh, that's amazing, Nick. I think the, the thing that's really important uh, for people to know is that um, one of the things that I'd thought about in the past when I'd been to Thailand and I had seen monks is that I kind of stupidly assumed that you were born to be a monk and that you were raised as a monk, that it wasn't a calling and that, and that you were Thai, you were born in Thailand. And so when I heard your story, I was blown away because I thought, ah, oh, he's, he's been a therapist in California. You know, you must have seen some terrible things and heard some terrible things. And so you, it's not like you're coming at it from in, in the temple and you haven't left your village. This is, you have been there and you've lived it and you've heard it and but and then you've seen the bigger picture of you could actually help more people solve their problems through the wisdom that you have so I, I'm really glad I found you and I'm really glad that you found your calling oh likewise thank you all right I guess uh now it's my turn uh to introduce myself and give you all a little insight about how I entered into the picture uh before I do that I do want to put out a little disclaimer that due to the short nature of time that we have to share our story, there are some things that I will highlight or emphasize that are specific turning points in my life uh, before I became a monk that are kind of ridden with conflict. Uh, but I don't want that to overshadow the reality of the deep uh, gratitude I have for the beautiful life that my family was able to give me growing up and the support that they showed me and continue to show me. So uh, for mom and dad out there uh, sending a very appreciative thank you for everything. Um, so with that wholesome note out of the way, uh, let me dive into the suffering. So <laughs> For me, uh, my story starts in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, that's where I was born and raised. And um, about 10 years ago, I fell on some pretty hard times, kind of the hardest times in my life, where after about three years spent at Penn State University, um, I really found myself entrapped in this hedonistic lifestyle where I was doing a bit more partying than studying. And that led to a lot of self-destructive, unhealthy habits and shallow relationships and just finding myself in a very dark place. And eventually I had to come back in state as I was wasting time and money. And at that point in my life, I really felt like a failure and that not only had I wasted the last three years of my life, but my entire life up to that point had been spent just coasting and doing what was expected of me and just following along. And I never took the time to figure out who am I? 
what do I value? What is my nature? And how do I live a fulfilling, wise, aligned, peaceful life? And all the while, as I was coasting along, I needed to self-medicate myself because of my own self-betrayal. And this led to me going spiraling to a very deep depression for about six months and uh, definitely the darkest point in my life. But luckily, with the support of my family and a therapist, uh, I was able to gain back some self-worth and start working again. Um, Unfortunately, made not such a good decision and started to work at a bar. And so all of my bad habits came back with a passion. And this really took its toll on my relationship uh, with my family. And I was, if I were to be honest, quite a toxic presence in the household, uh, not very respectful of their rules. And so in probably the most, one of the most important and significant parenting moves that my dad ever made, he set some strong boundaries and said, uh, you no longer can uh, live here. You need to find somewhere else to stay. You need to uh, take out loans go back to school. And whenever you're not in school, you need to be working and you need to do this or else you have to give back your car. So uh, for me, kind of forced into this um, plan A, so to speak, uh, that without much of another option I had to take uh, while I figured out a plan B. And for me, I recognized in that moment that I wasn't a kid anymore and it was time to take responsibility for my life and my own discontent. And in my search for a plan B, I found a meditation center close to my house, uh, started practicing meditation and shortly after found out about the opportunity to become a monk in Thailand. And immediately I knew that this is what I have to do. Uh, My bad habits are too deeply entrenched into my life and they're so wrapped up in this context that I'm in that I need to extract myself from this context. I need to put myself in a new context where I have wise individuals who can guide me towards releasing those things that no longer serve me and cultivating more wisdom and self-awareness. So uh, for me, It took me about two years to prepare financially and otherwise for this journey. And in that time, I dropped out of school, paid back my loans, uh, moved back in with my parents, uh, saved up a lot of money, uh, repaired my relationships with them, and got ready for what I thought would be a three-month stay in the monastery. Because I figured, sure, three months is enough time for me to unravel a lifetime of bad habits and become enlightened. But uh, unfortunately, it wasn't as easy as that, or I guess it's more fortunate, in fact. And three months has turned into about seven and a half years now and counting. And ultimately, what I found in the monastery uh, was myself. And it gave me the space to peel back the layers of conditioning of who I thought I was, of who other people told me I was, and get down to my true nature. And how do I live a life in alignment with that? And in that process, I met Venerable Nick uh, here in the monastery. We started um, writing books, making resources together uh, to serve as practical guides for healing and self-development that combines the ancient wisdom from the monastery to solve uh, modern problems using uh, mental health modalities as well. And for us, we want to make it as universal as possible and to go on that journey to kind of alchemize that darkness in our life and create light for others has been one of the most fulfilling things uh, I ever could have imagined doing. And uh, for me, it's an absolute honor. It has been to support from the background, seeing everything behind the scenes. And now I'm in front of the scenes and I'm a bit nervous to be honest. This is uh, going from internet anonymity to walking with the YouTube Titans uh, overnight. So (laughs) a little bit nervous to be in front of uh, such a potentially large audience. But uh, for me, I'm also very excited. I'm humbled. I'm honored. And hopefully the things that we share will be helpful for the audience. So Uh, that's my story. Oh, thank you for yours. I didn't know any of that, but Michael, I didn't know any of that. And I think 
what's evident is that we've all been to a dark place at some point in our life and we found the light however however we found that light to guide our way and then instead of keeping it to ourselves we're now sharing it with others and i think that's really really important because a lot of people find the light and then they want to charge for training courses and things like that but but we want to make all of this wisdom available to everybody so thank you for sharing your story i didn't know any of that and your father obviously it was tough at the time but he did he obviously made the right choice so seven and a half years that's incredible and how long have you been uh, a monk as well, Venerable Nick? When am I going? Six and a half? Yeah. Yeah, six and a half years. Amazing. Um, <laughs> and you both had a calling. It was an inner feeling. It was, uh, was it something you saw, something you heard, or something you felt that made you drawn to becoming a monk? I think it was a desperation. <laughs> and also it was just time. And for myself is I just knew that habits repeat, patterns repeat, that details will change. But I said, I'm ready to fix this now. <laughs> take me through whatever depths you need to take me into. Challenge me however you need to challenge me. Clear what we ever need to. Let's do it now because I'm yeah. so tired of this. I don't want to repeat. And with that, I said, it's now or never. And I don't want a small change, but I want a transformation. And transformation means I need to let go and yeah. just dive 100% in. Yeah, and, and I would echo that sentiment is that really I just knew that uh, I didn't know what was going to come of this, but I just knew that I'd never given myself the space to discover who I am. And I think oftentimes we just are in this rush to have check off all the check boxes. It's like, okay, I go to school, then I go to college, then I get a job and then I get a girlfriend, then I get a, uh, we get married, we have kids, we get the house with the white picket fence and where in there is the time to discover who you really are. And for me, I just knew that because of the depth of the suffering that I felt is I, I wasn't going to try to hope to find it sometime later down the line. I wanted to figure out who am I first so that I can, whatever I do moving forward, it can be in alignment with that deeper self-awareness. So for me, I really needed the environment uh, to have that space for introspection and self-discovery. And it really ended up resonating with me at a much deeper level than I ever imagined. Well, I think that the thing is, like you said, you're on this roller coaster from the time you leave school, go to college, and it's kind of mapped out before you. And you go along with it, and you're being bombarded by social media or mainstream media. And you're, there's a lot of pressure to perform, to, to win at something, to get the bigger house, to get the bit better car. And I think it's only when you're actually stopped in your tracks by the darkness that you actually have time to think about who you are and what yeah. you want and what makes you happy it was chasing the next shiny thing when you get the shiny thing you realize well that didn't make me happy yeah. Wh which shiny thing will will make me happy what do i keep what am i chasing but it's actually only when you're in the darkness and you're faced with just yourself you're there alone and then you have to look at yourself and say you know what am i doing what's going to make me happy what do i need to do What's my value as a human? What's my value to the world? What can I do? To, and then it's then you start looking and thinking, well, well, actually, I can help myself one step at a time out of the darkness. So um, I think it's very easy to get on a roller coaster of life and not get off. And it's only when you're hit with the darkness that you're forced to. But I think all of us have been there. But it turns out that actually... It, it's a place to visit. It's a place to explore. It's not a place to linger, but it's a mm. place where you can actually learn a lot. There's a lot of wisdom to be found uh, in the darkness. Just just don't stay there too long. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a, a very common thread throughout people's journeys of uh, transformation is that the suffering is what caused them, it called them to awaken the wisdom and the light within themselves. So it's, uh, I think for the people out there who are struggling with something is sometimes it feels like, why me? Life is is coming down on me very hard. And uh, sometimes we don't recognize in the moment, but it's precisely what we need to uh, cultivate strength and perseverance and more self-awareness uh, because it causes us to stop 
and to reapproach life with a new direction. So mm-hmm. um, I think that's uh, something beautiful that hopefully this podcast will uh, help people in that space to reframe that suffering and, and see that it can be the start of a beautiful journey. But it's also an opportunity to be authentic, isn't it? To be authentically you. And I think that's the thing. A lot of us are playing a role that's expected of us by society. And it's only when you take a step back and you become authentically you that you can completely change your life. And I know in episode two, we're going to be talking about transformation, which we'll talk more about later. But one of the things that really helped me was meditation. And I had no clue about meditation. I know I've told you this before. (laughs) I thought meditation before you enlightened me was the chance to have a sneaky five minute sleep, uh, but not actually (laughs) fall asleep. I thought it was a a time to just relax and not think about anything and and potentially a snooze. But of course, that's not what meditation is about. And we've been asked a lot of questions about this, which we'll answer later as well. But I know that the next part of our episode today is for you to briefly describe how to meditate how do we meditate Uh, so can you explain to the audience what is meditation and how do we meditate and i know after that we're actually going to do a guided meditation by you so i'll hand over to you venerable michael absolutely thank you so much and uh yes so before we actually practice meditation together for about 10 minutes i'll give a a very brief introduction this will be a a very small overview but we're going to dive more into the specifics after we practice so that you'll uh, feel it first and then you'll understand it later so um, with that being said typically whenever i introduce meditation i like to highlight a very commonly held mentality that people often have when they're approaching meditation which is that meditation is a time to stop our thoughts or to use effort in order to actively clear the mind. And this approach will lead to a lot of struggle and a lot of um, disappointment in the practice and very high expectations. Mm. And the reason for that is, is that the mind does not respond very well to force. And this is something that we already know, and we can, in fact, reflect. Perhaps there was a time where we were fixated on some troublesome issue, and we employed the ever so attractive technique of closing our eyes really hard and willing ourselves to stop thinking. Have you ever tried that, Gail? Oh, I've tried that lots. <laughs> but all you, all it does is it amplifies the noise in your head because exactly. you're trying to block everything else out. And the, the thing you want to stop is actually louder than ever. Right. So as a result of that effort, uh, we push against the mind and it pushes back even harder. So instead of this force, which we're used to doing, when we want to get something in the outside world, we push harder. We try uh, more. And it does lead to more results. But in this spiritual world uh, for meditation, we need a more passive approach. So in order to illustrate a more effective approach and mentality when uh, approaching the practice of meditation is I'd like to make an analogy of growing a flower. So when we grow a flower, do we take the seed and then peel it open and then try to pull out the flower from the seed? Well, no, of course not. But what we do instead is we set the conditions that are conducive for the flower to grow. So we find a nice pot, we find appropriate soil and sunlight and water. And then when we set those conditions, we simply allow the process to unfold. If those conditions come out of balance, we rebalance them and we continue to just watch it unfold. We are not actively causing the flower to grow. And in much the same way, when we practice meditation, instead of actively trying to push the thoughts away or to cage in the mind with effort or force, what we want to do is find the proper balance of body and mind that is conducive for the mind to become more still on its own over time. So then the question becomes, what is that balance that we're looking for? So the balance that we're looking for is a balance between comfort and awareness. 
So comfort uh, can be broken up into two different categories. First is comfort of our physical body. So we want to try to make our body as comfortable as possible. So for all of the viewers out there, and even for Gail yourself, I'd like to invite you just to bring your awareness, your attention back to your body in this moment, and just scan your attention from the top of your head down to the bottom of your feet and see if there's any tension anywhere that can be released, perhaps by a gentle stretch of the neck. Oftentimes we hold tension in the neck or the shoulders, uh, perhaps in the lower back, we can uh, find a more comfortable seated position for ourselves. Uh, the only thing we don't recommend is lying down because as Gail had just said, you <laughs> might just have a sneaky little snooze. Uh, and this is something we want to avoid because again, it's a snooze is you got the comfort down, but the awareness is not quite there. Yeah. So uh, this is in order to promote awareness, uh, we want to find an adequately upright posture. So uh, it's completely okay to sit in a chair. Don't have to force yourself to sit on the ground. And if you are sitting in a chair on the note of awareness is something that's very helpful is to kind of scoot back in your chair so that your lower back is in contact with the backrest. Uh, because sometimes we may find ourselves lounging too much and when you lounge and the upper part of your back is against the backrest, it can cause us to be very sleepy. So when people struggle with sleepiness, this posture can be helpful. So those are just some very basic ways of creating comfort of the body. And then the next thing we want to create is comfort of the mind. So one helpful mentality with meditation is treating meditation as a mental vacation like you're going to your favorite place to relax in the world, whether that's on the beach, whether that's by a river, somewhere in nature where you're all alone and it's a beautiful day. No matter what happened before the meditation, no matter what happens after, in this moment, nothing in the world matters and we just let it all go and we just allow the mind to rest. And that word rest is very important is because oftentimes we are trying to achieve something when we approach meditation with, I want to clear my mind. I want to have no thoughts. That is focusing on an outcome, but we want to focus on the process. And the process is about creating that condition of comfort of body and mind and balancing it with awareness. So again, this mental vacation is a helpful concept. The next concept I want to share that is helpful to create the appropriate level of mental comfort is to this concept of neutrality. So no matter what comes up in your meditation, in your field of awareness while you are practicing, whether that's a sound from the outside world, whether that's a sensation inside of your body, a mental image inside of your mind, or your own remaining mental activity via thoughts or emotions, whenever you notice that the mind has strayed to these things, first and foremost, we must know that this is normal and natural and not an indicator that you're doing anything wrong. Because a lot of times when people notice their mind strays, they're like, oh, I, I wasn't even meditating. This is, this, is not the, this is not the case. The mind will wander, the mind will, mind will get distracted. And it's very common for frustration or agitation to arise when we notice that. But again, instead of just like pulling the back, mind back very quickly and, and frustrated, what we do is we come back to that mental vacation mindset. It's okay. It's normal. Every time you notice just a little exhale, a little smile. Remember, we're on the beach. We're just relaxing. We're just resting. It's not that serious. We're not trying to achieve anything. And every time the mind strays, we just bring it back. We reconnect with a very light, gentle awareness. And if you know a meditation tool, such as focusing on the breath or a mantra, or something else you know, then you can bring it back to that. But if you don't know anything, then you can just bring your attention back to the sound of my voice when we're guiding the meditation. So this is the process of meditation. This is the balance we're looking for. Don't worry so much about a thoughtless mental space. Don't worry so much if the mind wanders. It's normal, it's natural, it'll probably happen. And when it does, we just relax and come back to that state of rest and that mental vacation. 
So with that, um, want to try some meditation together, Gail? I'd love to. I'd love to because we had so many questions, which I know we're going to answer the question. I've got lots of questions. So yes, please, I would love you to do a guided meditation. And I want people to know that our plan for this series is that it's kind of a building up of lessons, isn't it? And of course, the most fundamental lesson for me is to quieten my mind and to meditate. So please take it away and teach us how to meditate. Awesome. All right. So with that, I would like to uh, invite everyone wherever you are, unless you're driving or somewhere where you <laughs> should not be closing your eyes. Uh, if you are in a safe place, uh, make sure uh, to find a comfortable seated position for yourself. Adjust your body as much as you need to. Again, bring your awareness back to your physicality. Scan it through. No need to rush into being completely physically still, but just slowly settle in to that comfortable seated position and we will start our meditation together. So as always, as we begin our meditation, take as much time as you need in order to adjust your body, to find a comfortable sitting position for yourself not needing to rush into physical stillness. Just slowly discovering that adequate comfort of the body. And whenever you feel ready, if you have not already done so, you may softly and gently close your eyes. Closing your eyes in much the same way you would as if you were about to fall asleep. The way in which we close our eyes and set the tone for the rest of the meditation. So we make sure that if we feel any tension, heaviness, or pressure within the eyelids, that we take a moment to open the eyes once more, allowing that discomfort to fade away before closing the eyes again as softly and as gently as possible, almost as if your eyelids were barely even touching. And you may allow a very gentle smile to arise on your face feeling grateful for this opportunity to simply rest the mind. Letting go of any frustrations about any lingering emotion or mental activity remaining in your mental space. Letting go of any goal to push them away and simply embracing this moment to rest and enjoy this mental vacation. Taking in a deep inhale, filling up your lungs with positive and peaceful energy and exhaling slowly and steadily as you release all that no longer serves you. And with another deep inhale, drawing in peace and serenity. And with a slow and steady exhale, emptying out your lungs, along with all worries and stresses. And simply allowing your breathing to return to its normal and natural pace. Remembering that no matter what comes up into your field of awareness, whether that's sounds or distractions from the outside world, sensations within your body, images within your mind, or your own remaining thoughts or emotions, whenever we notice, we simply exhale any tension that arises, 
we smile and return our mind to that state of rest. And you may begin to relax every muscle in your body, imagining that your body is like a large tank full of water filled from the bottom of your feet to the top of your head. And slowly that water begins to drain. And with it, so does all the tension inside your body. Starting with the muscles in your forehead, allowing them to relax and loosen. Feeling all lines of tension unraveling and releasing. As this relaxation spreads down the muscles in your eyebrow, on the sides of your temple, down into all the muscles in your eyes and eyelids. Down to the muscles in your cheeks and your jaw, your lips, and your tongue down to the bottom of your chin, relaxing and releasing all tension and heaviness in the muscles of your throat and your neck, shoulders and your arms, your forearm down into the palms of your hands and to the tips of every finger. Allowing this relaxation to spread to the muscles in your chest and your upper back. Down the sides of your torso. To your abdomen and your lower back. down into the muscles in your hips and your thighs, your calves and your shins, down to the bottom of your feet, to the tips of your toes, feeling as if your body was hollow and weightless, and all remaining tension simply drained out of the bottom of your feet. Feeling lighter and lighter, more and more relaxed. Simply allowing very gentle awareness to rest within this comfortable and spacious feeling, as soft as a bird's feather floating down from the sky land on the surface of a completely still pond without even causing a single ripple. Maintaining this light and gentle attention for a few more moments in silence until we come to the appropriate stopping point.
maintain a very light and gentle attention with this comfortable feeling. And with a gentle smile, allowing that positive and peaceful energy to radiate throughout every cell in your body as you make the intention to stay rooted in this stillness and allow this positive and peaceful energy to stay with you throughout the rest of your day. And whenever you feel ready, you may softly and gently open your eyes as we have come to the end of our meditation. How was that, Gail? That was amazing. I actually forgot. <laughs> I actually forgot we were recording a podcast. <laughs> I was just, I wasn't thinking about anything other than listening to your voice and visualizing what you were saying and feeling, you know, scanning my body. That was incredible. And I think I, I do want to keep this feeling for the rest of the day because mm. I think when we're trying so hard to think of nothing, that's really stressful. But the body scan and the visualization, I feel. I feel I feel blissed out, and I, and I think that's something that everybody would like to feel is just totally blissed out at peace. And I'm not I wasn't thinking about anything other than visualizing what you were saying. So it's really really powerful. And I know we want to do a guided meditation every episode. Whether we should begin with it or end with it, I don't know. But I feel incredible. So thank you awesome. for that, Venerable Michael. Yeah. That, was, that was that felt incredible. Yeah, and, and that was great. And really what you did was you just set the conditions. Your physical body was relaxed. Your mind was relaxed. And again, it will take care of itself. And for me, when it comes to meditation, I'm a visual person. So I need like simple analogies. So for me, I brought props today. <laughs> oh, well done. Yes. So to understand meditation, I feel like this can be helpful, what we just did together. But what I'm holding is just a cup and inside is just clear water. And for this is this represents our mind and our mind is bright and clear. And if you were to look through it, you can see right through it. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not polluted or anything. That's how it starts. But for us as humans, we got to go to work. We got to make a living. <laughs> we have relationships to tend to. And what happens every time that we engage with our five senses and we use it, our sight, our smell, our taste, our touch, what happens is it clouds the mind. It's like we're adding dirt. Imagine every time you see, look at all your social media posts. <laughs> when you see that, it logs into your mind. It makes it uh, a bit more dirty and it adds some yeah. pollutants. When you listen to things like the news, ah, there you go. A conversation yeah. you had, an uh, argument that you had, uh, things that you saw as you're walking here, everything is logged into our mind and it keeps getting more and more dirty. And what do people do is, well, you can't unsee it. You can't untouch it or untaste it. <laughs> the, it's already clouded. And what people do is they keep stirring, stirring and stirring. And now your cup, your mind keeps getting more polluted. So the lens now that you're looking at the world is not so clear. It's distorted. So then what is the solution? And the solution is put your cup down. That's it. And allow the dirt, allow the debris to settle on its own. Gail, stop stirring. <laughs> stop I'm stirring. Good at stirring. <laughs> In fact, I had a situation yesterday. Somebody was trolling me. Really, they were quite <laughs> persistent with their trolling. And as much as I tried to ignore it, they were getting louder and louder on different platforms. And um, I went to the beach. I went to the beach uh, in the evening and I, d I tried to meditate. Well, in fact, I did meditate and I just let it all go. I just let it all go. And it's so true. I I went there. I, I kind of marched there because I was quite <laughs> angry, but I was upset. I was disturbed. I was mixing my uh, spoon. <laughs> and then I got to the beach and I just thought I need to stop. I need to stop this. So mm -hmm. I, I sat, it was sunset. It was, it was perfect. And I just, I just stopped. And I just, like you said, I did exactly that. I just let all those thoughts just 
settle. And I left the beach a different person. Mm, beautiful. Yeah, exactly what you describe when people are trolling you. It keeps getting the mind more yeah. clouded and more dirty. And what you did is just put your cup down. And imagine yeah. with uh, power visualization, imagine if we sat still, meditated for one hour. Now, this is what your cup looks like. Wow. All of the dirt and the debris Magic. yeah, falls all the way to the bottom. Your emotions start to settle. This is the process of meditation. Just set the conditions and your mind will clean itself, get out of the way. So then how does meditation help us? And for us is a few things is one is that what drives our behaviors? It's our likes and our dislikes. If you'd like something, something's positive, you want more. You go to it, you desire it, you crave it, you reach and you keep going. We're driven yeah. by our likes and our pleasures. And then what's the opposite? I don't like that. This is a thing that is not pleasurable to me. So we run away, we reject it, and we push. So our whole lives as humans, this is what we do. If we like it, we go towards it. If we dislike it, we run away. And now yeah. it distorts our behaviors. And what meditation is trying to teach us is see things as they really are not through your emotions, not through your likes, not through your dislikes, but just look at the facts for what they really are. See them neutrally without the critiquing. And this is the benefit of putting your cup down. Another benefit from us putting our cup down every single day is it makes space from stimulus and reaction. Of all the yeah. people who are watching, how many of you are reactive? right? <laughs> We're like robots. And when that troll is on you immediately without thinking, you're going to react. And what meditation does is it gives you that space of one second. Imagine five seconds, 30 mm -hmm. seconds, one minute when you're in heavy traffic and someone cuts you off. Ah, right there. A trained mind would have five seconds. 10 seconds, 15 seconds more. And this is the benefit that will start to show up. And also a last thing that comes to my mind is a lot of people are goal driven and focused and we're trying to be productive, which is great. Go do your thing, go achieve your goal. However, you may be going fast, but in the wrong direction. Mm. So for us, it's slow down people. <laughs> Slow down because if you're going fast, it may take you more time because you're making more mistakes. You're, you're going the wrong direction. So for us is slow down, get clear. What is it, your intention? What are you trying to do? What kind of life are you trying to live? Who are you trying to become? And when we can slow down, you actually will go faster. So one of the things that our master teaches us in the monasteries, what is the key to success? What is the secret ingredient to success? And the answer is stillness is the key to success. Stillness of mind is key to success. When your mind is bright and clear and neutral, it will help to propel you and your life forward. So I hope this analogy of the glass of water uh, really resonates with you. Very easy and simple. How does that sound to you, Gail? No, I really liked it. One of the things that I wanted to bring up was something you said in one of your recent videos, which is don't don't ignore your problems. You know, visualize your problems, but then in front of you, but then let them drop to the floor. And that was really really powerful for me because I'm one of these people that if I'm annoyed, you won't probably know I'm annoyed because I will hide it really well and I'll keep it inside. But of course, I haven't dealt with that. I'm holding on to it. I'm holding on to that anger or resentment or whatever the emotion is, and it wouldn't be a positive one. <laughs> I'm holding on to it and it, uh, I'm internalizing it. And when I heard you say that, I thought, oh my goodness, that is such a, because I'm a visual person too. So I imagine all my problems in front of me and then I let them fall to the floor. And that fits with your glass analogy, which is just let them settle. So if if I get a troll that annoys me, instead of holding on to it and resenting the amount of time that they're taking in my brain, <laughs> I can just okay, they're there, just walk past them, let them fall away. Yes. So 
the dirty water, the glass is is really, really powerful. I mean, I've got lots of questions for you and I could talk all day. We could talk all day, <laughs> but I have got some questions from um, some of our subscribers. So this is, is this a good time? This is a good uh, yeah, time. I think time. To ask those questions. Um, and we may have covered some of this uh, these topics already during the meditation part uh, exp- explanation. But um, the first one is quiet in the mind. And this is from at TM-NW7BN. Wow. It says, hi, over the years, I have tried so many times to meditate. I have spent five minutes every day sitting in a quiet place, eyes closed, mind racing at 100 miles an hour. I have tried guided meditations, mantras, walking meditation. How do I quiet my mind? Um, Yeah, this is a really good question. And uh, I think one of the things to kind of reiterate from what I had talked about earlier is a lot of times uh, we're focused on the results and not the process. And when we're focused on the results, that means I want to quiet in the mind. I want Mm -hmm. there to be no thoughts. And even Gail, what you shared, uh, one of the kind of hidden dangers of a good meditation or a meditation where your mind is very still is we want that the next time. And when you don't have, uh, when it doesn't happen, we get disappointed and we're like, oh, I lost it. I thought I had it. And it's the focus on the result is the issue because how did you get there today? It wasn't through trying to clear your mind. It was by setting those conditions properly. And ultimately for us, what is important is focus on your process. What is it that you did to to adjust your body, to adjust your mind, to be comfortable, and to have that very soft, gentle awareness. What were the factors that led to that balance being appropriate? And then the mind was able to get into stillness. Another thing that I think is very helpful to recognize is that some days, like the glass of dirt, we are adding a lot more dirt than other days. And there's a lot more things happening. We're absorbing so much from the outside world. We have more to clear, more to clean, more to settle. So naturally, some days, we're just going to have more work cut out for us. And if we focus on results with a different starting point, we're always going to be a bit disappointed. So instead of focusing on the results, We just want to focus on the practice and the consistency. And when we can get into a rhythm, we can get into a habit is the mind will progressively clean and clear itself. But I think you have some. Yeah, it reminds me of Gail when you were traveling two weeks ago to London and you had all these uh, uh, different things that you had to take care of. Again, your, the five senses was quite active, so it takes more time. And for me, is this question is so beautiful to understand meditation. This is common. And one of the things that can be very helpful is just know the process. What is the mechanism of what's happening? And the mechanism is all you have to do to reiterate this is set the condition. The conditions are get your body relaxed. Sit comfortably wherever you need to sit. Relax the body, relax the mind, which means you're on vacation, nothing to do. And then don't fall asleep. That's it. <laughs> have, a light and, yeah, have a light and gentle awareness. So these are the three conditions. These are the three factors that we need to set. And the key part is the mind will clean itself, not you. It has the mechanism to do that. The mind knows how to do that on its own. And for you, put a smile on your face and rest. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. And that will be helpful. And it's just like the the nature of a flower is when the conditions are right, it will grow. And the same and the same with the mind is when the conditions are right, it will become still. And if there's more to clear, it just takes a little bit longer. And that's okay. So there's one thing uh hopefully that people can take away from what we just shared is that there's no such thing as a bad meditation. Everyone was like, oh, that was terrible. I wasn't even meditating. Not not true. In fact, you were meditating and the mind was calming down, but we we judged it incorrectly. Is the process was unfolding. We just want to uh, 
get to that result. And so we, we, un, we harshly judged the outcome. So uh, hopefully that will be helpful for, for that person's question. Yeah. And we were asked that question in lots of different formats. It was the same question. Right. So we've got another one from Mary Dorot. And she says, is there an optimal time length that we should aim for? I've been meditating for about 10 minutes a day for the last three months and was wondering whether I should meditate for longer for better results and benefits. Should we aim to meditate more than once a day? Um, yeah, very good question. So, uh, Really, I think what is most important, the first goal that we should have in meditation is to practice every day. That, that's number one. And because the mind has been collecting things from the outside world our entire lives. And so as with any new skill, it is, it's going to take some time to get the hang of. So for those people who do not have a practice yet, I would say that's the first number one goal. And uh, once you get the daily consistency, the results will follow. But for this specific individual uh, talking or asking about like, should we uh, meditate longer in order to uh, get better benefits? Uh, ultimately, I think what's very important is to honor your situation because some people it's just not sustainable to meditate uh, an hour every day. It's just too much for them and they can't sustainably maintain it over time. The most important thing is the maintenance of it because if we just push really hard and then we get some good results, but then the practice disappears, it really wasn't that helpful. So uh, taking it slow and uh, sustainability is key. Uh, so I think that's the most important thing. Uh, and if you do want to slowly build up, I think Venerable Nick has some good tips. Yeah, I would say build the habit first. Uh, set a minimum time for yourself. And for me, I, when I started my journey, I wanted to be a meditator. I didn't want this to be just like, okay, try this here and there. But I want to be a meditator. How do you get that? And I figured out you just got to develop that habit first. So for me, it's what is a good time that that I can hit that mark. And I said five minute minimum, but I did that for one whole year, 365 days without skipping. So every single day I would sit. And then once I established that year number two, I sat for 15 minutes every single day. And then year three, no skipping every single day, 30 minutes every day. And then what you'll find is then uh, you can in the process, once you have the habit, you can start to improve the quality of it. But in the beginning, I would say, take out a calendar, pick a time that is best for you, but make sure to hit that mark of five minutes. And if you want to sit longer, sit longer, but just have a bare minimum and develop that habit first. Yeah. And sometimes people get a bit fixated on, oh, I heard like, three o'clock in the morning is a special time to, it's like, if you're interrupting your sleep and you can't hit that uh, consistently, don't worry about those special little things, but what works for you? And I think ultimately it's going to be a trial and error thing. Uh, what fits into your life most seamlessly? Because if it feels too much like a chore, it will not stick. So uh, just based on your own rhythms, uh, some people really like in the morning because it's before people want something from you. It's before you've collected yeah. things from the outside world. Uh, so that's very helpful for me. Back when I was uh, working at a restaurant, it was on my lunch break. So it was actually the middle of the day. I could always hit that. So I would get that uh, right in between shifts. So some people it's at night, depends on your energy. When are you most awake? When is your mind a bit more ready to become still? So uh, it's a matter of trial and error and you will find what works best for you. So don't get too attached about what you hear about this is the best time or you must do it here or there, uh, but uh, experiment and you'll figure out what works for you. Well, we've actually just answered the next question, which was from Lindsay-BM1MT. And she said, are there peak, peak times of the day when meditation is most effective for mind, body, and soul? But we've just covered that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to go on to the next one, uh, which is from Kirsty McCulloch. And she says, so my inquiry is advice around inspiration, motivation, and continuity of practice. 
she's looking for those things. I mean, she should follow your channel for starters. <laughs> but that's number, one. That's <laughs> number one, follow <laughs> Venerable Nick and Venerable Michael. Um, but that was from Kirsty. Have you got any advice for her? Yeah, I love this question so much. Uh, yes. Um, when it comes to inspiration and motivation, how do I really keep this practice going and uh, make it become part of my lifestyle? And for me, as Buddhist monks, we meet so many people, and even as a therapist before, people who are suffering. And a lot of people struggle with lack of confidence, lack of respect for the self. They don't trust themselves. And how did this come about? And for me is how this came about is because many times we betray ourselves. We say we're going to do this. We set a goal for ourselves and then we don't keep it. Today, I'm going to work out. No, you won't. Today, I'm going to eat healthy. No, you won't. And because of this incongruency, because we keep betraying ourselves, we keep selling ourselves out. For me is use meditation as a training tool to get more congruent to learn how to trust yourself what you're doing is you're setting a time for yourself today i'm going to practice meditation two minutes three minutes five minutes it doesn't matter pick a time yeah. and follow through and finish it and every single time that you finish it open your eyes cheer celebrate and know yeah. you're fighting for yourself and for me i'm passionate about this topic because that was me I was the guy that kept selling himself out. I was the guy that didn't keep his word. And I didn't, I, I didn't trust me. And I said, I need a tool. I have so many big goals and dreams. If you can't even guide yourself to close your eyes for two minutes, yeah. ooh, those big dreams and goals you have, you're not going to make it. So for me is for anyone who is going through a difficult time, use meditation to fight for you, fight for your life, fight for your ability to trust and believe in yourself. But I feel like this is bigger than that, where you use meditation to get to know yourself better, build that trust, build that confidence, build that respect in yourself. So this is a one mindset that can, can be helpful. So every single day that you sit down, cross it off your list, celebrate, pat yourself on the back, smile, go to bed, do it again. Yeah. Well, and, I think it's very, oh, sorry, you carry on. Oh, uh, yeah, just to, just to build off of that, that concept, uh, I think this is very key because really is a lot of times when we're not succeeding at something that we want to do. Uh, it's because we don't have like personal integrity is yeah. the things we have consistent proof that we don't follow through on the important promises that we make to ourselves. So when we make a promise to someone else is we're kind of on the hook, right? Is if you don't follow through, and this still happens a lot, uh, but you know, those people, they, we call them in, in America. I don't know if it's a, it's also a, a phrase elsewhere, but it's like, they're flaky is they yeah, make yeah. a commitment. <laughs> okay. It's the same everywhere. Okay. I didn't know if it was an Americanism or something, uh, but those people who they say they're going to do something, but they never quite do is what is the cost of that? You don't trust them. You don't trust someone who says they're going to do something and they don't do it. So it, it burdens and strains a relationship. But what we don't recognize is that when we constantly get in a habit of making and breaking promises to ourselves, we do not trust ourselves either. And that is so much more important because we, th we think that nobody sees it. Again, I'm going to eat healthy today and you don't. And there's a donut on the table at the uh, office. And it's like, mm, maybe not today. And right there, we just, we betrayed ourselves. And again, in this small scheme of things, is that donut going to completely ruin your life? No, but the issue is there are so many opportunities to make and break promises to ourselves. And if we get into a habit of doing it, we are collecting so much 
evidence subconsciously that we are not someone who follows through on the things that we say we're going to do and that we know are most important to us. So ultimately meditation, although yes, it cleanses the mind, it helps you see things more clearly. I think an underlying overlooked skill that it can build or quality that it can build in you is this personal integrity that every time that you wake up in the morning, and this is why it's a great habit to build that personal integrity is because every day, five minutes, you just make a little deposit and you're collecting new evidence. I am someone who follows through on the important things in life. And you'll build up that confidence. You'll build up that trust. You make that deposit in that personal integrity to count, not withdrawals. We don't want to be in the negative, but we want to be a person of integrity. And this is how you can fight for that every single day. So I think this concept is so huge. So I'm, I'm glad you you brought it up. Yeah, I was going to say that it's like exercise. I mm-hmm. actually don't like the idea of exercise. I actually don't enjoy exercising. But when I've exercised, the feeling that I get is phenomenal. And of course, if you go to the gym for 20 minutes for one day, you're not going to see a difference. If you go for 20 minutes every day for two weeks, you're not going to see a difference. You might feel a difference. But within six weeks, you will see and feel a difference from going to the gym. So I always think that meditations like that, you you might feel good for a few minutes after the first time you meditate. And like you said, you want that the next time. But if you keep going and you make it part of your promise to yourself that you'll give yourselves five minutes every day, within six weeks, you will feel the difference. You will feel it. And um, it's so powerful and it doesn't cost anything apart from time. And I get a lot of people saying, oh, I can't exercise because I'm too busy. Oh, I can't meditate because I'm too busy. But these people are on social media telling me that. And I think, well, nobody's on social media for five minutes. We all owe ourselves five minutes, two minutes. You know, if you only have two minutes, it's two minutes for you. You know, it's it's for your own benefit. And I think it's so important. So yeah, I would stick going back to the kind of motivation and inspiration. It's invest two minutes or five minutes every day, keep going and you will feel the difference after six weeks. Yeah, and for my audience who aren't familiar with Gail, this oh, is yeah. a jump rope jump queen, rope master. <laughs> <laughs> jump rope master, and it reminds me of the same thing. We're just developing that habit, mm-hmm. uh, not worrying so much about the quality or the of form, jump roping, or the speed. but just jump. <laughs> yeah, jump. every single day and fight for yourself. And it it was bigger than yeah. that. And to see how you built that confidence over time, and to get to where you are now, just keep going. That's so true because when I started jump rope, I kind of set myself this crazy goal of I would do 3,000 jumps in one go. Oh, wow. Um, And (laughs) I know. And I I think (laughs) after the day one, 20 jumps in, I I was on the floor (laughs) gasping for breath saying, why did I say that? I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. And um, day two, I was creaking like an old galleon and I was like, oh, I'm too old for this. I can't change. Uh, But no, I'd set the goal, so I had to stick at it. And every day I jumped, first day was 20 second day was 100, third day was 150, and so on and so on. And now, without even thinking about it, I do 3,000 jumps a day. Wow. And I, I'm in the rhythm. It's I, I'm totally in sync with it. I've got the rhythm of the rope. And even though I might think, oh, I've got to wrestle with my sports bra, I've got it, uh, it's hot, I'll come up with all these excuses – I know that when I've done those 15 minutes, I'm going to feel amazing. Then I follow it with a cold shower and then I will take my dogs off down through the orange grove here in Portugal and I will go and sit just for five minutes just to calm myself down and meditate. And I've set myself up for the whole day. Mm. And all of the, you know, you can jump on the spot, that's free. You can have a cold shower, that's free. You can meditate, that's free. These are all free things that we can do. Mm. It might not be jump rope for everyone. It could just be, you know, move your body and um, just take time out to settle that water. That's such a, oh, that's such an amazing picture, that visualization of the water. Um, I thank you for, thank you for bringing props. That was really, really good. (laughs) What else do we have down here? You never know. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been scanning through uh, the questions that we had, and we have actually answered um, most of these. There's one here that we haven't answered, and it says, uh, this is from Dala Buell, 427. 
what are your oh, sorry what are you ultimately trying to achieve when you meditate can there's two questions here can you meditate to curb food cravings or to exercise um yeah so i think again what we're trying to achieve in meditation is creating that space again once we create the conditions that allows this to happen like what is the purpose what is the outcome and when the mind settles is we have more clarity and we have more space between stimulus and response so when she talks about craving is absolutely it can help with that because when you have more space between again what's the stimulus the donut on the table if we have no space we're lunging and we're cramming it in our face but if we yeah. do have all you need is one second more and where does that come from it arises on its own when you take time to let the mind settle in the morning for meditation every day it creates a bit more space between what happens in your outside world what shows up via your five senses maybe it's the smell of food maybe it's the uh, the sight of something that you crave that is not healthy and typically we're right in there but again when you have space because everyone knows it's like i don't want to do the things that are unhealthy for me nobody really wants to but the craving pulls you and compels you to do it but when we have that space is we can make there's a space for a new decision where there was not one before so this honestly for me is the magic of meditation and in my story uh what i didn't share is in that 2 years of preparing to become a monk i used to be uh i had a short fuse i was an angry driver <laughs> and when people cut me off like it ruined my drive and that would snowball into the rest of my day and i would show up at wherever i was going more tense and more reactive but the first thing that happened to me after starting to meditate frequently was i started driving slower when people cut me off there was that initial and then there was a release and that little space i wasn't like actively i didn't tape up reminders don't get mad in traffic it was just that because i practiced that meditation there was a bit more space so those thing those compulsions of what happens in the outside world there was more space for me to respond with wisdom as opposed to react with emotion so uh yes definitely it can help with that yeah and and same thing with the physical body what is the goal of exercise eating healthy all of the things we're doing is for health just to get your physical body as healthy as possible and the same thing for the mind and meditation what is the goal get your mind as bright as clear as possible what people forget is that the mind is naturally luminous it's bright it's positive it's motivated it sees the good it's that's its uh, nature but for us is with our interaction with the world then it starts to get more clouded clouded by our desires clouded by our wants clouded by our emotions our ways of critiquing things so for us is meditation is just simply setting the condition for the mind to clean itself when the mind is bright the work that you're going to do and the life you're going to live is going to be truly remarkable well I Actually, you made me laugh, uh, Venerable Michael, when you said you you drove slower. <laughs> it's the same for me because I'm like driving Miss Daisy in my little old Renault. Whereas I used to try to drive everywhere, kind of flat out, get there as fast as I can. Right, I'm just like a little old. I'm like a little old lady now with my handbag <laughs> on the dashboard, just pulling along uh, because I'm not in a rush to be anywhere because I I don't need to get there quicker. I want to enjoy the journey. So you made me laugh because actually, I think my my average speed has gone down considerably. That's good. We need we need more little Miss Daisies in traffic, not not NASCAR racers. <laughs> we definitely do. Yeah. Um, now uh, that that's the end of the questions, and we've answered all of them. But yeah. I know that you, Venom Michael, have got a exercise that you wanted to share with the audience that they can do between this episode and the next episode. So, do you want to tell us a bit about that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I think we'll try to do uh, this at the end of every episode is give you some actionable steps to take all of the theory because we threw a lot of concepts at you. Um, and how do you take what you've learned today and put it into practice to integrate it into your life in order to feel the benefits? So my challenge to all of you. Homework. We have some homework <laughs> and we will be checking you will get in trouble if you don't put it, if you don't submit it, um, is to, for the next 30 days until we meet again, is to practice meditation every day. Now, I know that sounds very difficult, but um, we're going to eliminate all of your excuses with many resources that I'll share about right now. First, uh, I'm sure we'll probably put it in the description or something like that is we'll have uh, habit trackers that we've created for you so that you can print it out, put it up on your wall and check it off every day, feeling proud of yourself, building up that personal integrity account. And we also have a very simple 10 step to do list that will help you um, figure out what do I need to do? Where do I sit? When do I sit? What do I listen to? What do I sit on? Uh, it will talk about all of those things to make it very clear what you need to do. Uh, we also just recently finished our meditation app. We'll keep updating it into the future, but uh, that is, we're very excited about it. Maybe we'll pop it up on the screen in post-production, um, but it's going to be, it, it'll have different aspects of it that'll be very helpful for you. One is that we'll have a daily meditation that will populate automatically. It will kind of randomize the different meditations that we have. It'll have a daily wisdom quote to inspire you. It also has a library that is going to be categorized some on some focused on meditations that are focused on helping you overcome troublesome emotions like anxiety, anger, stress, sadness, some that are for morning meditation, some that are general grounding and others that help you sleep. So all of these are going to be under 15 minutes. So from one to 15 minutes. So for those of you again, who say, I don't have time to meditate, we eliminate that because you definitely have at least one minute. Uh, and now you have guidance that will help you through that. And then last but not least, for those of you who want to take it even a step further and you really want to understand the theory and about any obstacles that you face, what do I do? I want to learn uh, deeper. We created a, a meditation retreat that can be done at home. It's video led. And uh, there's a one-day retreat and there's a three-day retreat. You can do it by yourself or with friends or you can just consume the videos at your own leisure to learn the basics, the fundamentals of meditation, how to position your body, how to support it with bolsters, what you can sit on, many different things about all the fundamentals and all the questions you'll have about meditation. And we will provide all of those things for you in the description. Uh, last but not least, I would like to encourage you all to uh, share your journey in the comments maybe. And for those of you who are gonna make that commitment, maybe you can check in once a week and come back to your comment and share, uh, what did you learn? Uh, what things were helpful or effective for you? What obstacles did you face and solutions that you overcame uh, those obstacles? So this way we can create a very supportive community in the comment section so that you're not only learning from the things that we share, but you're learning from each other. So uh, that's my little uh, homework assignment and the resources that we have to support you on that journey. So. Yeah, thank you. For me, I'm pumped. I'm so excited because whatever has happened in the past before, remove it. You haven't been yeah. exercising. You haven't been meditating. It doesn't apply anymore. Let's start fresh. As a community, as a group now, let's fight for ourselves. Pick a time that you can sit. And once you sit, celebrate and start. And this will be the foundation. This will be the beginning for your transformation. And throughout the months, we're going to go bit by bit. Just take something that helps your life. But I feel like this is a great foundation for you to start on. And we'll keep building and growing and uh, changing together. Brilliant. Thank you both so much. And I want to thank everybody for joining us on this journey through uh, Eastern wisdom meeting the Western lifestyle. And that was episode one. And for episode wow. two, we're going to be doing transformation. So stay tuned for that. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel, Venerable Nick's channel.
And together we can build this amazing community for peace and supporting each other, like you said, definitely in the comments. So if you're not subscribed to me, subscribe to me. If not subscribed to Venerable Nick, subscribe to Venerable Nick. And now it's time for us to sign off. We've been a long time, but I think every minute was worthwhile and it's great value to all of the subscribers and listeners. So I'll hand over to you, Michael, Venerable Nick. I ah, can't speak. <laughs> I'll hand over to you, Venerable Michael, for our sign off. It's okay. Venerable is a big word, four syllables. It is venerable. It's, 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 it's a mouthful. <laughs> That's why we condense it to Ven. You can just Ven Michael, it's a bit easier. Um, but yeah, thank you, Gail. And thank you for everyone for joining us. It's really been a pleasure. And we're looking forward to this uh, series and continuing to provide value for you. So until next time, may you all be happy, healthy, wealthy, and well-balanced in every area of your lives. May your mind be pure and bright. And may that inner radiance shine outwards to make the world around you a better place and a brighter place thank you for stopping by and have a beautiful day hey thank you everyone thank you